You can open our Bibles once again and, and continue reading from Matthew chapter 10. This time we'll start reading out our text at verse 24. Read up to verse 33. It's Matthew 10. We'll start reading out verse 24. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household. So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Thus far the reading of God's word. Congregation of Christ, Many Christians have suffered for their faith. Some have even been martyred or killed. One of the most famous accounts of martyrdom in church history is what we call the 40 Martyrs of Sevast. These 40 men were soldiers in a Roman legion in 320 AD. These soldiers had become Christians the Caesar at the time, Licinius, ordered all of his soldiers to sacrifice offerings to the pagan Roman gods. The 40 Christian soldiers in one legion refused. So the local governor devised a plan to test their faith. They were to be placed on a frozen lake, which is in a mountainous area of Turkey. They were left naked and exposed to the freezing wind on the lake. The governor said that if they recanted their faith, they would be allowed to leave the lake and enter a warm bath on the edge of the lake. If they refused, they would, be, they would freeze to death. Now the 40 soldiers didn't even wait to be forced onto the lake. They took off their clothing and walked out voluntarily. They encouraged each other to hold fast under the persecution and opposition. And for three days and nights, the group endured. One young soldier left the 40 for the warm baths, but the shock of the warm baths killed him. One of the pagan guards, seeing the faith of the remaining 39 soldiers undressed, proclaimed himself a Christian and joined them, and thus the number remained at 40. By the morning of the fourth day, most were dead, and the remaining soldiers who were still alive were killed. You see, 40 men, soldiers, chose to freeze to death rather than disown their Savior. This is a famous story in the Roman Empire, and it happened around the time of the Emperor Constantine, and therefore it was one of the last stories of martyrdom in the Roman Empire. And these 40 men illustrate an enduring truth in Christianity. Following Jesus Christ is dangerous. It's serious life and death business. And often persecution is good for the church because it reminds the church that you, 
church is, it reminds the church that Christianity is not about what we do or where we go or what church we belong to. It's about the fact that we follow Jesus and that following Jesus has life or death consequences, both on this earth and the next. And Christians all over the world, even today, are still suffering for their faith. They are opposed, maligned, taunted, beat up, threatened, and killed. In fact, there's even a website that tracks persecution in the world today. It's as www.persecution.com. It's got a website for an organization called Voice of the Martyrs. You can read stories of Christians who are being persecuted on that website even today. You can hear a story, for example, of a woman named Poonam from India whose husband beat her and kicked her out of the house because she left Hinduism and became a Christian. And yet, even in her darkest hour, living outside with nothing, she did not renounce her faith. Or another story, again, these are very recent stories, Susan in Uganda, whose Muslim father beat her and threatened to kill her because she had become a Christian. He locked her in a confined space for three months until her neighbors rescued her. She weighed 45 pounds when she was rescued. And yet she did not renounce her faith, even though she now has to walk with crutches for the rest of her life because of the malnutrition. And so many of these stories could be told, and you can read them for yourself. Even in this church, we've heard stories from people who have been persecuted overseas, uh, places like Pakistan or elsewhere. And I think sometimes we North American Christians can be a bit surprised by these stories. How could, people, how could this happen? How could people be so cruel? We haven't seen this necessarily face to face. But if we read the words of Jesus, these stories should not surprise us. Jesus warns us that this exact thing is going to occur. He says in this chapter, in, in the pre verses previous to our text, he says that, this, that you disciples, he says, now that I'm sending you out to preach, people are not going to be kind to you. And in verse 22, he even says, you will be hated by everyone because of me. And then he continues in our text in verse 24. He says, look, the student is not above the teacher nor the servant above his master. In other words, if I've been mistreated, and Jesus was mistreated and killed by his enemies, if that's what happened to Jesus, don't expect that you who follow Jesus will have it any different. He says it is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants, like their masters. In other words, it is enough for students to experience something like the teacher. And then... If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? So worse things might even happen to those who follow Jesus than even what happened to Jesus. And it is, and we could say it maybe better this way, if Jesus has been persecuted and mistreated, it is that much more certain that his followers will be. Christians... Now, first of all, Christians in this passage are called members of Jesus' household. His servants or his students. It's a fascinating description of our identity. That's who we are. We cannot escape that. In fact, we want that. But if we want that, we should then be prepared to suffer what those things will mean. And one of those things is persecution. Jesus says, they called me Beelzebul. Why is that so bad? Well, by calling Jesus Beelzebul, they call Jesus evil. Beelzebul is the word for Satan for many of the Jews. It's a slang term. And by calling Jesus evil, it paves the way for persecution. It's the strategy of the devil. If you can call good evil, then you permit the community to do bad things to that person. Society has permission to do evil to those things that they call evil. Remember one illustration that I think really illustrates this. In, it was a picture, uh, I can't remember if it was on World Vision or elsewhere. There was a little African boy, six years old. He's malnourished, doesn't look good. 
And this little boy, it said in the description of the picture, lived on his own as an orphan in a village. He had no home. And you might ask, well, why? Well, the picture explained why. The village thought that this little boy was possessed by a demon. And therefore, the village felt that it was their responsibility to shun and mistreat this six-year-old boy. The witch doctors had dehumanized him. And therefore, the village had the right to mistreat him. In fact, it was their responsibility because he's a demon. This is why the Pharisees called Jesus Beelzebul. He's evil. Okay, all of you, now we've got to kill him. And this is part of Satan's strategy against God's people too. You think of, and we read these earlier stories of Hinduism and Islam, other, maybe other tribal religions. And in a, in a village that believes in a certain religion like Hinduism, someone becoming a Christian threatens the established social order. They're a threat to the gods. And if appeasing the gods is very important to preventing anger from falling on the village, then the person who becomes a Christian is a threat to everything and therefore must be mistreated. And the same as in the Roman Empire. We saw that the 40 men who were of Savast who were killed... These men threatened the order of the empire because sacrificing to the gods kept everything together. Therefore, they were called evil. Therefore, they were to be killed. And that's the way the world treats Christians. That's the way the world treated Jesus. And even today, the woke mob does the same. Christians are the bad guys. They should be shunned and maligned and pushed to the margins of culture because they don't agree with the new orthodoxy. And Jesus says, this will happen to people who follow me. Don't be surprised by this. A student should not consider himself above his master. Don't look at your suffering and say, how dare God bring this into my life? No, Jesus says, this will happen. This is part of Christianity. Now again, us Canadians may find this uncomfortable. Many of us are not so familiar with this type of suffering. We've been fortunate We've been above our master. It's an unusual situation, the peace and prosperity that we've experienced. However, I do think this suffering is more present in our lives than we might think. We can think of attitudes in our workplaces. Many people disparage the Christian because the Christian is honest, or should be. They disparage us because we won't gossip about the boss, if indeed we're not. <laughs> You can think of those of us who use our public schools. Our children are taught things we don't agree with. Our, our views are not welcome. I remember even we had a meeting in this church for our local city councillors, and there was one school trustee running as a Christian because she felt that my views aren't welcome in this school, and I want to I fight for that in, in the school system. Again, our things like our pro-life views and certain views that we have on gay rights and other things, they're not welcomed in this country. And we get away with it for now because we're a bit isolated and society doesn't necessarily know. But it's not inconceivable to have protests outside this building for what we believe. It's coming and it's, it's there but not there yet. There's only one comment. If you've never experienced any opposition for being a Christian, some self-examination... If, if an unbeliever finds you completely unobjectionable, it could be, and I say could be, maybe not. It could be because they don't know what you actually believe. You've never told them. It could be. Something to reflect on. Now, what do we do about this? What do we think about this opposition, this persecution in the world, this threat of it? And of course, our answer to it could be that we become overcome with fear. And even I, I've noticed that even in my own life and in other lives, especially for those of us who have, are used to the comfort of North America, our, our assessment of our society and where it's going is often couched in this sort of fearful anger. We see things like our whole society is going mad. What about our children? What kind of world are they leaving for them? Their lives are going to be worse than ours. Our culture is destroying itself. How can things hold together? 
Our politicians are idiots. We just go, you know, this, this talk. The woke activists are going to destroy us. There's narcissists and abusers everywhere. Where can we find safety from them? We're losing the privileges that we enjoy and we don't like it. We fear the disapproval of our friends and our neighbors. And this fear often drives us to nostalgia. We romanticize the past. Oh, it was so much better in 1950. We're anger at the present. We're angry at the people who are taking our security from us. Or a low-grade anxiety. We're just anxious all the time about what's happening and we don't even want to read the news. We want to escape from our culture and just hide in our little bubble and pretend it's not happening. Let's just enjoy life while we can until things get worse. How, how should we respond to this? What does Jesus say about our response? What is his prescription, his comfort? And this is our second point, if we return to our chapter. Our second point in Jesus' response, his command to us living in a world that's dangerous is very simple. He says three times, he says this command, the most common command in the Bible. His answer is, do not fear. Do not. Or maybe in the Greek, it's do not have fear. Three times he commands it in this passage. Now, it's fascinating. I want you to think about this. Jesus' answer to struggle, persecution, suffering, and opposition in this life is not that we pray that it get taken away. Nowhere does he say that his primary concern is that it gets taken away. No. His message is that we should expect it and his care, his concern is what we do and how we respond when it comes. This is his great concern. In fact, I wonder if the martyrs of Savast, if their prayer on the lake would have been that the persecution stopped. I think their prayer was, may we be faithful to Christ in this moment. And Jesus, resp your response as a member of Jesus' household will show Jesus glory or it will bring him shame. And this is Jesus' concern. I think COVID was a good dry run. I think many, we, most of us, I think collectively we failed to respond well. I think that was an example for next time. There's a lot of infighting, a lot of finger pointing, a lot of anger, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. It was not a glorious time. And I have a prayer that as we read this chapter of Jesus and read the teaching of Jesus, may we grow for the next time. And remember also that Jesus is talking about a particular type of suffering. He's talking about the suffering we experience as Christians, because we belong, follow Jesus, therefore people do not like us. He's not talking about being sick or, or other forms of suffering, although the, many of the things he's about to say apply to those too. But primarily, what does it mean to suffer for following Christ and preaching Christ? Now, and one more thing before I go on. Jesus' tone in this passage and his, his heart is revealed. His tone is not, hey, stop being foolish. Don't fear, you, you fools. No. Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't beat us over the head and say, get over it. No, he, he, Jesus is going to explain, just, he's just going to gently explain why fear just doesn't make any sense. He just wants to broaden and reorient our perspective by showing us the actual facts. And he gives four arguments as to why fear just doesn't make any sense for the Christian. He knows we will fear. He knows we're going to struggle. But he just wants to explain to us the way things are. And the first of the four, at least there's at least four reasons why fear is inappropriate or just doesn't make sense, 
Verse 26 is the first one. You can see it here. Jesus says, do not be afraid of them. Your persecutors, or for the disciples, it would be the, the Jewish Pharisees, the enemies of Jesus at the time. Do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. You see, people who persecute Christians, they think they know how the world works. They don't think that there's a God who's in charge. Or if they do, they think that God is their God and not the Christian God. And so because they have a certain view of reality, they think they can get away with mistreating people and that there will be no consequences. But Jesus says everything will eventually be revealed and the truth will be revealed and it will be shown that they were wrong. And that Jesus is Lord. And that by persecuting Jesus' people, there are consequences. And if all is revealed, it will be revealed that God is not patient with those who mistreat his people. Revelation 6, verse 15, it says this, The kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich and mighty, everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Why? In Revelation 16, the bowl of God's wrath is being poured out. And the kings of the earth suddenly realize that God is in charge, and they're like, oh, shoot, we were wrong. And so what do they do? They hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? The true facts will be revealed, and it will not be pretty. And so Jesus says, you don't need to fear because eventually the facts will be made known and the people who are mistreating you will find out who God really is. And of course, this is, an, I think, a prophecy of the, the final day, the judgment day. It's a little bit like, and so the comfort goes a little bit like this. It's a little bit like when we read about uh, World War II. Many of us had grandparents that lived in World War II, or maybe we didn't, or we had grandparents who fought in World War II. And often when we look back at World War II, we enjoy the stories because they end well. The forces of freedom win World War II. Nazi Germany and Japan, militarist Japan are defeated. And then at the end of the war, the people who survive go back to their prosperous lives, and maybe they immigrate and what? And there's sort of this is encouraging. You see, here's the thing. If you're a German, nobody in Germany likes studying World War II. In fact, they're, sh they're ashamed of World War II. If you go to Germany and you mention World War II, the people there, they don't want to talk to you. But here in North America, we like talking about World War II because it represents a victory for our culture and our country. And that's how it is as Christians. And Christians, we know how the end is going to go. And so therefore, in the present, the story should have a positive spin, in a sense. We, when we suffer today, we know that at some point it's going to end. We know that God's going to win. We know. And therefore, that makes suffering in the present bearable. And it means fear doesn't make sense. It makes what's happening now bearable and survivable. The middle is easier when the end is known. And the fact is, for most of us, our suffering is limited to a few decades, if even that. And then we get blessed in eternity. Romans 8, verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. As Jesus says, all will be revealed. Nothing that is secret now will not be revealed. So whatever people have done to you, it's going to be known. God knows it. Jesus says in, in the next verse, What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. And so, what's the point? Jesus is saying, I am teaching you disciples now. And it's sort of hidden. He's just teaching the 12. He doesn't, 
and only they really get it at this point. And he says, there will come a time when you are now going to preach what I've told you to the whole world. Now why is this relevant in this passage? Well, here's the thing. Everything is going to be revealed on the final day. So what should our responsibility be right now when things are not revealed? Our responsibility is to tell people how things actually are. In fact, Jesus is sort of saying here, in a sense, your concern in persecution should be that your persecutor falls under the wrath of God. You should be terrified about what's going to happen to that person. Compared to whatever torture they're giving you now, the wrath of God for an eternity is infinitely worse. You need to tell them what is wrong with what they're doing. You need to point them to the God in heaven. That is a part of our response to persecution. It's do not fear and preach. Tell them the facts so that they have no excuse. Which leads to the second reason why fear is just n doesn't make sense. And this is verse 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The biggest problem that we humans face is the wrath of God, not persecution. There will be a reckoning. And that's the thing we ought to fear. Humans can only kill bodies. God can, can punish the body and the soul. In fact, it, it isn't it often the case if you read accounts of persecution that as the person is being mistreated, I think of the story of Brother Yoon in China, he's put in jail. And as this horrific punishment is upon him and the people in jail mistreat him at the same time God is filling his soul and producing this incredible peace in his soul the body is being afflicted and the soul is being filled they can, these people cannot touch it it makes no sense to fear people who can only touch your body so Jesus says don't it says, rather, preach the gospel from the rooftops. Now, in counseling, there's a major concept here. Often in counseling, one of the concepts that's used by counselors is called fear of man. Many of our pathologies, our anxieties, our worries, our, our <clears throat> the things we do wrong, they come from fearing people more than God. When your horizon... This is God's horizon is, let's say, this big. When you begin to fear what other people do or say, your horizon shrinks. It goes to this. And suddenly, you could, your world becomes like this. It's like kids in high school. They care so much about what their peers think because their whole world is this tiny little high school. And this way of thinking creates so many pathologies. You become afraid of your fellow students when you think that they determine your reality. And social media makes this worse. And it basically makes all of life high school. Or worse. Fear of man. Letting people determine how I feel, how I think, and who my God is. And what you fear, what you love most, will determine who you are. And Jesus says, fear God. Love him. And on the one hand, I think maybe you're, if you're afraid of the word fear. On the one hand, Jesus means we should fear God's wrath. We should, and there's a sense in which, as human beings, we ought to have terror of God's wrath. God's wrath should just shake us to the core. He's an all-consuming fire, and your sin is about to be consumed by him. And if you don't repent, you can imagine this all-consuming fire. Think of the magma in the center of the earth. And if your sin continues, you are at threat of falling into that lava. And yet on the other hand, Jesus tells us that he is gentle and lowly, 
merciful and loving. And all over the Bible, God speaks of his love for his people. And he says, do not fear. You're resting in my arms. And so as we recognize the terror of facing God's wrath, when we see the love of God and the son that died for us, we then rest in his arms and the fear should dissipate and we feel peace instead. And therefore God can say, do not fear the most common command in the Bible. You don't need to. I've taken care of it. You are safe with me. And this is our third reason not to fear is verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And this is an allusion to slavery. In the Roman Empire, a slave was worth, at least in the time of Jesus, a slave was worth about 500 denarii. A sparrow was worth half a penny. And if a sparrow is important enough to be sold in the market, and important enough for God to care about it, how much more than the slave, you, worth 500 denarii? And if God cares about the life and the death of each little sparrow flying outside this building, how much more than his people that he purchased with his own blood on the cross? And not only that, it moves beyond God's purchase of us. It also moves be to God's providence. God knows us so intimately because he created us that he knows the hairs of our head. You're never far from the Father's care. He never stops looking after you or watching out for you. If he knows the numbers of the hairs of your head, how many times, there, how much more does he know than the times in which you've suffered for him? How much more in those moments was he watching and guiding and caring and filling? How much more than will he give you the courage to preach in those moments of crisis? Or just to preach even to your own soul? How much more then will he do all of those other things that we need? If that's who God is, imagine somebody in your life knew you so intimately that they knew the numbers of the hairs of your head. How much trust would you have sitting in their car or their living room? You would be completely at ease. You would be so comforted in such a person's house and you know that they had their your highest interests always in mind and that they would be willing to die for you to protect you if someone came through the door and wanted to rob you and kill you this person would stand up and knock that person dead you would have no fear in such a person's house and yet this world is god's house why would we fear in a house where the, the master of the house has that kind of care for us. You see, it's not that we don't fear. It's just that our fear doesn't make any sense. We will fear. But God is, Jesus is simply saying, look, if you knew what I knew, it just doesn't make sense. Why? And so when we are in situations of fear, that's the perfect time for the gospel to be preached to our souls. And if we don't have someone to say it to us, then we can read the Bible and have it preached to us. That's the way we answer our fears. We truth bomb them. That's what Jesus does in, in, in a kind, compassionate way. And Jesus then says, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. On the one hand, this could be seen as scary. But I'm not, and there is, a, there is a fear God more than man aspect to this command. But ultimately, this should be a comfort. 
And what Jesus is really saying is he's saying, the thing I care most about in your struggle and your persecution is that you confess me. You acknowledge me. You homologeo, same word. You say the same thing as me. You stand with me. You're part of my household and you make that clear. That's the thing I'm looking for. That's the thing I want you to do. That's the thing that I am going to fill you with the ability to do. Don't worry about the persecution. Don't fear that. Think about what you're going to do when it comes. How will you respond to it? And, and also, will you live your life in such a way that people will need to persecute you because you're preaching too much? It could be that. But the fourth comfort is Jesus will confess your name before the Father in heaven. Of all the things that we need in this world, is that not the thing we need most? It's a little bit like growing up in a household where maybe you're a son or you're a daughter and you craved the approval of your parents. And you lived your whole life trying to find that. And your parents always withheld it. And we have a bit of that with God, too, where we live our lives craving the approval of God, wondering, does God care about me? Does God just have wrath towards me? Does God just hate me? Does God just looking out for me and judging me all the time? What is it? Jesus is saying, I will confess your name before the Father and your adoption as my, the Son of God with me will be assured. God will welcome you. He will own you. You will be his. There will be no need to justify yourself to him ever. You will be welcome in the throne room of heaven because Jesus has said, this person belongs here. You will not need to experience God's wrath. Instead, you will get his love. If Jesus is willing to confess your name in the throne room of heaven, you're good. And so why be afraid of a single thing if Jesus is in heaven saying, Eric Underwater, you belong here. And the father says, yes, this is my son too. Say your, say your name on your lips. Jesus is speaking it in heaven now. If you confess his name and you wear the flag and the banner of Christianity in your life, and not just by words or by taking on certain social issues, but by living like Christ, Jesus will say, this person is welcome here. You won't need to live your life wondering what's going to happen when you die. If that's what Jesus is willing to do for you, how much more than ought we to worship this man? This man who would become us so that he could rise into heaven to represent us, to deliver us from the coming wrath, to deliver us from the present age of narcissism by being the opposite of that, in Psalm 36, it says, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. And now listen to the, what's going to happen to the people whom Jesus speaks in heaven. This is what they're going to get. They will feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. They take refuge in the shadow of your wings. This is what we get when we belong to the household of the Lord and confess his name. We get to worship and drink from the river of delight. Amen.